and growing of fish and things like that, and he will speak about that this evening. Uh, Dr. Merlin Jensen is a horticulturist, and he's a specialist in plants and animals, and um, he's been called an agricultural futurist. He grew up in a rural farm area in Washington State, and his major uh, work of 25 years, he has, has major work in 25 years in 45 countries on developing intensive food systems for developing communities. He was the designer of the Land Pavilion at Epcot Center in Florida, and he's a senior consultant for the Biosphere 2 project and project in Arizona. He was brought here by uh, Phil Silverman, the coordinator, one of the coordinators for this lecture series. Uh, it was a great pleasure. I introduce Merlin, Doctor, excuse me, Merlin H. Jensen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Glenn, and I really am pleased that I can be here. I uh, seems to be this month for California. I was just a few days ago at Cal Poly talking to a large number of students about this biosphere that we live on and how we can become better managers and architects in what we do in the future. And then to be here with people with, with such great interest in this, and, and it happens I go back to Cal Poly next week and again talk to a group of industrial people again about pollution matters and so forth. There's a great deal of concern throughout the world about what we are doing in Biosphere One and I will go into that with you to tell you about some of the predicaments we're really in. I don't come here to really tell you about doom and gloom, but I'm really coming here to tell you about the opportunities and alternatives that lie ahead for us as we move forward into the year 2000. I used to always be a bit ashamed that I was an agriculturalist and uh, I would go on a plane and I would never tell anyone that I was a horticulturalist because I always had feelings that people would image me without, you know, what, 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 I, what are you doing in a suit when you really should have bib overalls and knee boots on. But today I found in America there is really incredible interest in, in food production and growing plants. Uh, and I think America's having a longing to get back into, into rural settings. If we could somehow figure out economic ways to bring the country back to the city, I think we would have a real winner. You are a participant in that longing. If you eat at any restaurants today, we like to go to restaurants that look like old barns. We have salad bars that look like farm markets. We're all longing to get back to the land. And Walt Disney recognized this when they built the land pavilion. They felt it would probably be the best, best pavilion that they had ever built. And they came to the University of Arizona to have us work with them because having opportunities to work on agricultural programs, whether it was in Egypt or whether it was in the country of Mali or Zaire, communities that were very poor and also communities that were very wealthy. We knew that people were interested in what their future would be as to security down the way in food production. And so, thank goodness, Disney believed in us and we went ahead with this and built a lot of Imagineering into that show and a lot of people, especially my fellow agriculturalists said, who would ever want to come to Walt Disney when they're coming to see the Mickey Mouse to ever see agriculture? Man, we've been to Iowa, you know. I mean, we've seen corn growing. How could you ever make agriculture that interesting? Well, in the five and a half years since it's been open, we've had 54 million people through the pavilion. It's been visited by more people than it's ever visited any pavilion that Disney has built. We have 35,000 on the average of, uh, uh, per day. And 75% of all the letters coming in from those that visited the park are a result of the land pavilion. And so we know people are indeed interested in their future, the security of their future, and the basis of that future is water, food production, and how we manage this planet that we live on. So to talk to you about Biosphere 2, which is a tool that will be used to better understand 
this planet that we live on, I think will be very important for our future. And I want to talk to this issue basically from a standpoint of agriculture, that, from agriculture, that it's more than just plant, planting, as I, I always think many times people believe that we just plant the potatoes on the hillside when it's ready for the potatoes to be harvested. We just pull the steak out and let them roll in the basket. There's a lot more to that in food production. And so I want to go over some of the thinking process that we have to go through in order to provide enough for everyone. So if we can go ahead, I'll, I, maybe, I, there we go. Okay, let's start with biosphere one. That's Earth, planet Earth. It's covered with about 70% water. 99.9% .9 of that water is tied up in the polar ice cap in the oceans, salt water. 20% is desert and ice. And there's 10% arable land, 5% 5 5 of which provides most of the food. How are we going to feed the billions of people in the year 2000 is a big concern. Today we have roughly 5.2 billion people, but in the next 11 years that will go to 6.2 billion. Five billion of those people will be in the developing world. 16, half of these people are 16 or under, 16 years or under. And half of those will be living in the super cities of this world, whether it be Cairo, Rio de Janeiro, New York, or Beijing or whatever. We have some very major, major uh, challenges that lie ahead with all of these young people who very soon will be having children and looking for jobs. So the population is skyrocketing. They say in 1990 that we will have a population growth every year, about 92 billion people. That 80 of those million, uh, 92 million people, that 80 million of those people will be in the developing world. So what we have to figure out is how we can take the technology that we study and work with today and be able to offer it to these people at the price of an aspirin. Because if we don't do it, we're going to have a real problem on our hands. And so when we talk about the, the challenges ahead, it's more than just a developing world, which only is about a billion people. We have to be concerned about the five billion people because we are one small community. Man has been able to do a lot in his indigenous area by going in and terracing the land in order to produce enough. And you see this all over the world, whether it's in the country of China, Yemen, or in the Philippines, or even countries have been able to push the oceans back and double their agricultural lands, such as they have in the country of Holland. But unfortunately, man has not been a good manager. In many areas of the world, water is a pollutant because it's so heavily laden with salt that over-irrigation will salt the land to the point that they have to move on. We have this in California, just in our own Imperial, our own Imperial Valley. We have areas of land that have been overgrazed. Much of Africa is suffering this problem. You can see on the right-hand side where it was fenced, where the cattle were kept out. But on the left-hand side, this is now the case in most of those countries, where the water today, rather than falling onto land that's covered with grasses and shrubs and used to be taken into the soil, it's running off. And the soils today don't have the moisture, and we don't have the moisture being given off by the land. And as a result, we don't have the cloud formation and the rainfall that we used to have. Here we have a population that's going up by billions every 10 years, but yet our rainfall stays the same. And remember, the water that we have on planet Earth is 99.9% .9 unusable. And so as a result of mismanagement on the land, we see the, the land moving. And we have roughly two and a half acres of, two and a half million acres of land in Africa every year that's taken up by sand that's moving into these cultivated areas. I've gone into countries where c presidents of countries have literally begged me to do something to stop the movement of those deserts. I've had long discussions with President Barry, a country of Somalia. What can we do to, for him to prevent these very irritable, productive lands 
being taken up by what we call desertification, I can't even say the word. In fact, I visited a country in the country of Cape Verde, where an entire community was overtaken by a sand dune. The only evidence left of that was a smokestack of the brick factory, but everyone had to move to a new island. So it is a problem, and I want to show you that. And as a result, with many technologies we bring in, we only bring part of the technology, and as a result, there's not enough water. And this is the condition that we get into, mismanagement. Now, I understand, and you understand as well, that a lot of this is brought about by governments. But it's not always that case. It's learning how to better manage what little we have. And as a result of some of this, and we, 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 we've heard about the, the whole the ozone problem, we've talked about the buildup of CO2, and the buildup of CO2 is a critical issue. If we keep burning fossil fuels at the rate that we're doing it, they say in, in the year 2025 that the parts per million of CO2 will, will have doubled and will raise the temperature on planet Earth roughly five degrees. When planet Earth was five degrees less, it was during the Ice Age. So five degrees makes a very big difference. But because of all of this, there's been a lot of books published. I call them armchair researchers, people that write doom and gloom, how the other half starves, born to, born to starve, times of famine, and so forth. But I don't really believe that. I think we have technologies today that will feed three times the people that we have today on this planet but we have to do it in some organized manner. At the University of Arizona, we have been involved at the Environmental Research Laboratory in developing agricultural systems in various communities throughout the world. And as Glenn mentioned, that I've had an opportunity to work in some 45 countries, basically on some intensive systems, many of them greenhouse agriculture, where we have been able now to produce food crops where never before they've been able to produce vegetables. Went into the little country of Abu Dhabi and built right on the, on, on the sand dune that was 14 foot above sea level. A pure sand dune where we came in with, with, with technologies on growing vegetables, producing roughly 500 ton of vegetables from that five acres every year. What vegetables really brought to the party or to dinner, you might say, are the vitamins and minerals that we need in our nutritional balance. And with this pure sand, we were able to now to grow cucumbers and vegetables that they really had never had a chance ever to, uh, to see before. And then those systems extended into systems that we call hydroponic food production, where we grow with no soil whatsoever. And we can grow on A-frames such as you see here. These are not practical at the moment, but they work very well. But what we're doing is producing food on a cubic volume basis rather than over a square foot basis. So we can get twice the production in a given area over those production systems that we see today with no soil whatsoever. Every three minutes, those roots are misted with a nutrient fog, and those plants will grow perfectly, perfectly okay with all the nutrition that you would have if they were growing in organic soils. The chemical which goes into the plant, whether it's from animal waste or from chemical fertilizer, it's in the same chemistry. So I, I want to make that one thing clear. Here how we, this, this is how we might grow tomatoes one day on the planet Mars, where the tomatoes are traveling on a conveyor belt, they go through a nutrient fog, they be fed and watered, they have one area that we pick them, so forth and so on. We even clip the roots because the roots become extremely long. We've had roots over 16, 20 foot long. We give them a haircut every, every week and we take them and dry them and feed them to the fish. The nutrient content of that root is about 16% protein, so nothing goes to waste. Well, it's that kind of technology that we will take one day into low Earth orbit. We might be growing lettuce and spinning drums to create gravity, so that geo, uh, uh, centrifugal force will allow the plant to grow normally, leaves up, roots down. These systems have all been developed, and I'm sure one day they'll be taken off to the planet Mars. But when we have to go to planet Mars, what we will, how will we live? Well, there's a group in Arizona that are talking one day that they will develop a biosphere, what they call Biosphere 2, that they will take that technology off to a lunar base or to the planet Mars. Now, that is not that far off. 
I think it won't be in too many years that we'll read about the Soviet Union will have a man on Mars. Now, whether the United States wants to be a participant in that, I'm not sure. It will be up to you as a taxpayer and whether you see benefit in this type of endeavor. But we also believe that if we do not ever take this off to another planet, that by using this model here on Spaceship Earth, that we will be able to do things inside of this biosphere in order for us to better understand Biosphere 1. We can create acid rain. We can build a CO2 in that unit. We can spray with a chemical to see how long it might get in our coffee cup. We can do a lot of things in here and work on a totally regenerative, balanced ecological system. And the management systems here in this community might be the management systems of tomorrow that we will use in our super cities so that every bit of the waste that comes from, from human waste or garbage or whatever will all be recycled back into the system. And you're probably saying right now that I don't want to have anything to do with that. If they're going to be recycling human waste, forget it. I don't want anything. And many times I will go into large audiences and I will say, who's been to New Orleans? Oh, everyone likes to say they've been to New Orleans to the Mardi Gras. Well, if you ever drank water in New Orleans from the Mississippi River during a dry year, it's probably already been drank five times. So you, if you've been to New Orleans and drank the water, you are already a good participant, candidate for Biosphere 2. Okay? Well, we find that in, in waste, there's a lot of nutrient, and we got to have plant nutrients for plants to grow. So that's a very important, important part of this whole balance that we're trying to, to understand. Well, what they're going to be doing in Biosphere 2 is that they're building, oh, it's very similar to what we call the Gaia Principle. James Lovelock out of England come up with the, came up with this principle, and it's, it's a very interesting principle, but it's the oceans and the, and the savannas and, and the, ocean, uh, and the uh, rainforest and so forth, deserts that all work together to maintain this balance, this ecological balance that we now, many of us, take for granted. And so rather than going thousands of miles from a tropical latitude to a desert, they're going to do it in 300 feet. And they're going to build all these different ecosystems in this unit and then off to one side, they will build a productivity unit of roughly 20,000 square feet or one half acre that will produce enough food for eight people that will go into this biosphere totally closed for two years. And so the first thing you have to do is to, to look at, well, what do people eat? And we, we started looking at the diets of man throughout the world and we find out that roughly 85% of all the calories and protein that we consume in this world come from eight cereals. And so they are a very major part. And in fact, almost all the food, 95% of the food that we have by weight comes from only 30 different crops. That was very interesting. Well, we started looking at what the U.S. current diet practices are, what the goals are, what the diets were designed for the Gemini programs, the Russian programs, and then we had our Biosphere 2 diet. And we looked at the percentage in regard to carbohydrate, protein, and fats. And then we had to come up with, with uh, okay, how many calories are we going to be expending in this, in this community? Well, we know we won't be sleeping all the time. We won't be walking all the time. What will be the physical activities of these people who will be in the biosphere? How many calories will they need? But it gives you the calorie, an idea of the calories per hour that are expended by the various activities. I thought that just might be a, of little interest to you. You know, if you're a couch potato, you're going to, you know, not use many calories, but you're going to eat a lot of cracker and popcorn and so forth. You can see why we have a lot of weight problems in America, and I'm one of those people. And then we have to look at the ages of the people, and we have to look at their weight. And then we have to come down to the amount of calories that they will consume. So once we have that, then we start looking at the crops that we will grow, and we start looking at the legumes. Now, a legume is any plant that produces a pod. And we're interested in legumes because that plant is able to work with a bacteria, and that bacteria will then is able to take nitrogen gas from the air and put it into a form that a plant can use it. That's very important because I'm not going to have seven, I mean, Ace Hardware down the street to go and buy my bag of fertilizer. 
But I'm going to bring in, rather than a bag of fertilizer, I'm going to bring in a bag of bacteria. And we're going to call them rhizobia. So we're interested in, in this rhizobia works in a symbiotic relationship with these legumes. So legumes are very important that we have a rotation program with legumes that deposit nitrogen in the soil so that the next crop might be a cereal, which is wheat or rice or whatever, that could benefit from that nitrogen that's been deposited. So these are all the legumes and the non-legumes that we will have. And we're even talking about animals that will go in there. Now, since we first designed the animals that would go, we, we pretty much ended up only on fish. And I will talk about the fish in just a moment. But we, we find that if you get your protein through meat sources, that you will need to grow five times the area of grain for that protein to go into the animal and then to get enough animal pr protein for you as a person. So we can save five times the area if we rely on protein from plants directly rather than through animals. So that's a luxury, a, a, very, luck, uh, a, a very luxurious way of getting protein is through animals. So that's why you see in many of the poor countries they eat grain directly. Okay, Biosphere 1, we see that 65% of the total area in America is used to grow soybean, corn, and wheat. And that's basically just to grow that's basically for animal food. We had 43%, now we've got that down to, to almost 15%. But we're basically going to go to a lot of vegetables and a lot of legumes, which are basically the other crops listed there. But I basically wanted to show you that most of America has planted the soybeans, corn, and wheat. Corn and soybean mostly going to animals to provide you the diet that you like to have. But the other thing I want to point out that in America today, it takes about 4,000 square meters or one acre to support one person. But in the biosphere, it's been designed that 230 square meters will be used to produce for one person. So 18 times greater the production must be in biosphere two in order to feed everyone. So this might give you a layout with the old designs of what the floor plan would look like in, 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 in a, at a particular moment growing in there. Okay, let's keep it going. So we have to, what we have to do now, we have to stagger everything. We just don't go into that biosphere and plant everything at one time. What we have to have in here is that the, when the, we have to plant some plants and they're growing vigorously and they're taking in the CO2, but we're going to have other plant material that's rotting and decaying and giving off CO2. I mean, if we have everything taking up CO2, where are we going to get enough? So. The thing is that we want that, that decaying log. One of the reasons why we're having CO2 build up in our atmosphere in Biosphere 1 is not only because we're burning fossil fuels, but we're cutting down the forest at such a rapid rate that the decay of that material that we're cutting down is giving off carbon into the air. And a lot of this happened in the country of Brazil and in, in, in many other countries that we read about. So we have to plant some, have some growing, some decaying, some being harvested, different stages in order to have this balance of ox CO2 and then the oxygen also. Oxygen also, okay. So we'll move on. So it's a very complex system. And these are all the things that we have to look for. I'm not gonna go into this. This is a, a, a plant physiologist nightmare, but anyway, we have to, we're interested in that part of the plant that we eat. I don't want to grow a big crop of something that we only eat a little portion of it. We want as much of that biomass that we grow to be edible. And so these are all the different things that we look at, disease and insect resistance and all these, so forth and so on. I just basically show you that, that there's many, many things that have to be considered. Okay, a lot of this work is happening in just uh, common looking greenhouses at the University of Arizona. But it's in those greenhouses that we are really concerned about the environment. We know that if we don't clean the air properly, that we have a lot of contaminants that will actually poison those plants. We know that in most of our homes today that we have volatile organics, oh, 300, 350 volatile organics that we're breathing because of all the plastics we have in our homes. The worst thing that ever happened to us was in 1972 when we had the energy crisis. All we, 
We all went down about weather stripping to put around our doors another piece of glass on the window. We made our tight a house a better gas chamber. Now I don't want you all to run home and throw your rugs out and and bring in cotton. We, well, cotton farmers would love that, but the thing is that we have some problems today. We have a lot of people cutting back on cigarette smoking and so forth, but we still have the same about the same incidence of cancer, I'm told. Okay, so the same thing is with plants. That air has to be clean, and if that environment is enclosed tightly, we have ethylene, carbon monoxide, uh, uh, methane, all these things being produced naturally that we have to clean up. How, we, how, how are we going to clean that air? Well, I want to show you something that's going to be designed into the architecture of homes and buildings in the future. This is called a soil bed reactor. What a soil bed reactor is that we take microbes that are in that soil column and we're pushing air through that soil. And that air that contains the gas contaminants, that gas is broken down into CO2 and water. These are called soil bed reactors. And if we're going to have the soil there, what we're doing is growing plants from out of that soil. There's an article in the PSA magazine this week talks about house plants. A guy by the name of Wolverton at NASA says if you have 12 uh, airplane plants and a couple of other creeping Charlies in your home and you're able to pass air through that system, you can pretty much take care of those volatiles that I just talked about. So plants will play a very important role. But it's more than just the plant, we know it's the microbes. And we're actually testing now, pushing air and cleaning air up. And it's working very good. And we think that we have, you know, a lot of people today in new buildings go in and they're sick because of all the, the formaldehyde. I don't know what's coming off. Maybe it's not formaldehyde, but there's a lot of, a lot of hydrocarbons. Just put a piece of plastic on your dashboard for, for about a, a half a year and watch the sun strike it and see that windshield cloud up. That's what's going into your lungs. Okay. okay, so those are some of the things we have to get on. And then we have to worry about the environment. If we have a closed chamber that's completely airtight and we don't exchange the air, the humidity builds up. Builds up, builds up, builds up. And pretty soon that plant doesn't know whether it's in the ground or in the air. And it's growing roots right out of the stem. This is a tomato plant. And even the roots will grow out of the flower clusters. And so we have to be able to understand not only the gases in the air, but the water that's in the air. And we have to be able to keep that water down so that these plants will grow normally. Because if we allow this to happen, there's a lot of leaf material that gets in there and we get secondary molds and a lot of disease problems. So just little things to think about. Okay, what we do in testing these crops for Biosphere 2, we bring them in from all over the world. We're working with Nobel Prize winners, Dr. Borlaug, we're working with the International Rice Research Institute, and we work with the Indians over at Ikrasat, and we, we try to bring the, the very best in. Because remember, we have to produce 18 times more in this little enclosure than what we normally produce in this very productive land that we have in America. Okay. So we bring them in and we harvest them and we, we, we weigh to find out how much leaf material there is and how much grain we get. And we're looking for those that produce very little leaves and mostly grain. If I could find the wheat plant that would just produce wheat and no leaves, that'd be great. But we have this thing called photosynthesis. And uh, that is the conversion of light into carbohydrate. But we have, to, we have to take this all into account. And then we find that we have soybeans. Just had a great meal tonight at a Chinese restaurant and all the meat that tasted like shrimp and pork and it was all made from soybean. Couldn't tell the difference. So here we have a soybean that grows in the sun. Just beautiful soybean. They said, by golly, we got it made. We got this new soybean in from China and we'll just plant it all year round. And we plant that same variety in the winter and this is all we get. Oh my gosh, it's got a response to light a photo period response. And so now we have to go back to the Chinese and say, you know, we got to have a variety of soybean that's day length independent. So anyway, it takes a lot of, lot of work just to find the right soybean that you can grow year round. And then we have this nice looking barley and they say, by gosh, we're going to make some good bread there. We might even have a little extra for some beer. And you walk in the next morning and it's all laying on the ground and, and, and it's all starting to mold. 
So right away you go back to all the geneticists and plant breeders throughout the world and you say, I've got to have a body that has a very short stem. So they start sending them in and we test them and we, yeah, there they are. Some pretty short stem ones and they will flower and produce grain very low to the ground. But you see all those leaves sticking up straight? We like that. We don't want them to kind of lay over lazy because they're not good receptors of light. We got to have those leaves up there to get that light because it's those lumens of light that go into that chlorophyll through the process of photosynthesis that then we take that energy from light and put it into calorie energy that gives us that ability to do all that work in the biosphere, you see. So we got to have a cover that allows a lot of light through. You know, I don't want to grow mushrooms in there. I want to grow good wheat and barley. And so we have to have structures that will give us ample light. And we got to have sorghum varieties that will be short to the ground and not fall over when they get very large. Because we do have a lot of equipment up there and we are reducing lights. And when you know when you take a plant and you put it under darker conditions in the home, it gets very etiolated. It wants to fall over right away. You probably experienced that in your own home with some of your food crops especially. And then we want to take that land and put as much as we can in one small area. And I just returned with the Academy of Science in China for two months and had an opportunity to see how a people, a country, is able to feed one-fifth of the world's population on only 5% of the cultivated land in the world. And this is how they do it. They put a lot together. They got some Chinese cabbage, some cabbage, they got some corn, the beans go up to corn. They don't have any wood poles there. No, the corn is growing. The, wood, the corn is the wood pole, but that corn is also producing. It's got the leaves reaching out there, catching the light. In the meantime, the beans are going up. In the meantime, remember I talked about the legumes? The legumes that take the nitrogen from the air and put it into the soil so some of those grasses can get it. So the beans are harvesting the nitrogen and the corn is gobbling it all up along with the beans. And so here we are, we've got beans and corns growing right together. Not a new idea. This was here with the American Indians hundreds of years ago. It's just some of the old ideas. You ask the American farmer today, say, oh my goodness, we can't plant beans and corn together. I mean, they just get all mixed up. I said, buddy, if you can put a man on the moon, you can put a man on the moon, you ought to be able to put the corn cobs this way and the bean seed that way. So we got a lot of alternatives. We just got to set our mind to it. You know, the biggest problem we have in America, we think a lot of things today impossible. Impossible. I'll tell you, the biggest limitation we have is our mind and how we think. So you as designers and architecture, you have to remember that. There's nothing impossible. Okay, these are the little guys that, the bacteria that work on the, on the roots of the legumes. This happens to be red kidney bean, but they make little houses there, little nodules, and this bacteria, they live in there. And they are able down to take this gas from the air, the nitrogen gas, and put it into the form where the plant can use it. This is what we call a symbiotic relationship. And then also we have other ways. We have rice that grows in water, of course, and in the water we have a little fern that grows. We call that a zola. And that little fern is the house for a bacteria called anabina. And it's that little bacteria that also can take nitrogen gas from the air and put it into element form that that plant can then use it later on. This is how China feeds so many people. They don't have big fertilizer. Oh, they're getting bigger fertilizer plants because that population in China is growing a lot faster than we figured. We thought that 54% of the families over there only had one child, but in the last census taking, because free enterprise is coming in. They're all able now to sell on the market with freedom at any price they want to, especially the vegetables, and the old farmer's saying, yeah, I better have another kid because I can have more to sell on the market, you see. And they're finding now only 15% of the families have one child, so China's got a, it's got a real problem again. And uh, not only does China have a real problem, India has a real problem. Out of every 62, no, every, every, out, of every, out of 62 born every minute, 20 of those are out of India. And with the population going up to India now, 700 million people, it's going to bypass China in just not too many years. Unless China, you know, but China looks like it's on the road again too. So we got some problems there. Okay, we're going to go back and look at some old crops. We're going to look at some of the old crops that, here, here's the crop that was the major grain of the Aztec Indians. 
And then the Spanish came over, and what the Aztecs were doing, this is what we used to call in the farm pigweed, they call it grain amaranth now. And, uh, but it's a very interesting grain. They, they used to take this grain and mix it with human blood. They did a lot of sacrificing in those days of humans. And they would take the blood and make it into little figurines, and then they would eat this whole thing after the ceremony. And what was happening was that from this grain they got a lot of lysine. Lysine is an amino acid that you find basically in animal protein. But here is a plant that has a lot of this one particular amino acid. But the lovely thing about it, look at the number of leaves. It hasn't got many leaves. And it's got a whole lot of seed. And the nice thing about it, it only takes half the water of wheat. It's what we call a C4 plant. But it's a little seed, you see. And the thing is that we go in with our big machines to harvest it, it all shakes off and falls on the ground, and we only get half of it in the bin. And so in the next season, we've got a lot of weeds coming up, and it's too crowded, we've got to thin it out. Well, the biotechnologists are going to take care of all that, but one of the things that's great about this plant, we can also eat the leaves. We can also eat the leaves. And if you see this plant growing in, in, in this area here, you'll see a lot of the Hispanic populations going around picking these leaves, it tastes like spinach with a nutty flavor. So you can take that seed, here it is. You can take that seed and you have black seed in different colors, but you can pop it just like rice or popcorn. And you can make it nice into a nice little pop thing and mix some molasses in it. And you go down to Mexico City and you buy it as alegría, the little squares. They eat it a lot of Mexico and it's full of lysine, this one amino acid that we find in, in, in the animal protein. They even make cereals out of it. They had some peach chips in it. And I tasted the cereal and I think it needed about five more peach chips. <laughs> but it's a beginning, you see. It's new foods and we have to learn how to prepare them. Too bad we don't have some old diet books there from the Inca Indians, you see. But anyway, these are things that we have to go back and look at. Sweet potatoes. You go around the world and they not only eat the roots, but they eat the shoots. Very, very nutritious and protein. Very, very good. And then we're looking at some new kinds of crops also. Now, you, we thought we had one that we could eat the leaves and the seed, and we could eat the roots and we eat the leaves. Here's one you can eat everything. This is a supermarket on a stock. This is called the wing bean, the soybean of, of, the, uh, of the tropics. It comes from New Guinea. It's called wing bean. You can eat that bean uh, at, like that. Uh, you can eat the leaves. You can eat the flowers. You dip them a little flour and deep fry them. They taste just like nice mushrooms. They have a swollen root. You take the stems and use it as firewood. But anyway, these, these are kinds of crops that we're going to be looking at, not only in Biosphere 2, but we think we have great importance in Biosphere 1. In fact, I have a friend by the name of Jean-Pierre Halle that has single-handedly gone into the country of Zaire and saving the pygmy. I don't know if you read about Jean-Pierre Halle. Fascinating guy. He's for real, folks. He said, we got about 50 organizations trying to save the well, and no one trying to save the pygmy, so he thought he'd go in there single-handedly and try. He stands about six foot seven, and you ought to see him stand alongside all these little pygmies. He said, it's really going overboard. They're starting to name their kids Jean-Pierre L.A. But anyway, <laughs> he's brought in the wing bean, and, he, and, and it's, he's really, you know, as he said, he's trying to save these little human beings with this here wing bean. Okay, then we have to have oil crops. We have sesame, you know, we, and it's very rich in oil. And then we have sun, sunflower. Is that the crosswalk telling me I'm supposed to cross? No, no. They have these different beepers in here. They say if you're... Okay. Okay, sunflowers are very important. You know, we, oil is extremely important as an energy. Just look at all the ways you look that you use oil. So we got to have oil in here. And we know that if the sunflower, by the way, the sunflower is the number one vegetable oil in the Soviet Union and the number two now in America. You go through Minnesota and Dakota and just go mile after mile. It used to, be, used to just be a bird seed operation, you see, but now it's number one oil. And we know that if we grow that sunflower outside under full light, it has 32% oil in it. But we go into the greenhouse and reduce the light 20%, we get that oil content down roughly 22%. So light is very important. So we're looking for sunflowers that will have high efficiency in photosynthesis that will give us over 30% oil content. Well, we can grow bananas too. We went to China and got this Cavendish banana and it does fantastic. We grow coffee, we're growing tea, 
and a number of things. And they're all dwarf types that have been bioengineered that are going into Biosphere 2. We even have some crops that are developed that we can't get seed from. We can't get seed from it, but they're so fantastic that we're going to propagate them by cloning them. For example, I'm going to use this as a carrot. Here's a carrot that has a core that almost looks like the outer part of the root. It's got a good crispiness and it's a carrot that's high in vitamin C and that's the one we want to take with us. But see, we can't get any seed from it. So what we do, we go and take a little core out of that carrot and I pop that into a, a little nutrient auger that's made from seaweed out here in the ocean and we put some growth regulators in there gibberellic at and all kinds of things, kinetins and so forth. And now that starts to grow and it grows cells very profusely. And then we take that callus and we drop it into a solution and we dissolve those cells and then we put some other goodies in there, growth regulators, and we initiate those cells to grow roots and shoots. A root and a shoot. So let's take a close up. Here we have a root and a shoot coming on this cell. And then what we do, we take that whole thing and we put it into a pill. It's what we call an artificial, uh, artificial seed. We put a saline solution with a resin coating, and now that will last for an indefinite period of time, just like a normal seed. And so then we plant that, and it, that we have all these little pills we take up, but we can plant that, and it starts to grow normally. But this is the kind of thing that we're getting now through the adventures of Biosphere 2 and a biotechnology that we think will be a spin-off for Biosphere 1. Okay. The other thing is I want to talk to you about and that is food losses from pests. I don't know if you realize it though that 46% 40, of all the rice produced in the world is lost to, to rodents and insects and different things. But we call them pests. Look at all the percentage of, of food loss. We can't have that in Biosphere 2. We also know that if we grow rice, corn, and beans in a temperate area where we have a colder winter, where the pests are killed out because of cold, we don't have near the problem as we do in the tropics. Why do we have so much malnutrition and so many problems in the tropics? Because the pests just don't die. They just go on cycle after cycle. Well, what are we going to have in Biosphere 2? It's going to be like the tropics. We're not going to have a winter there. So we have to face, you know, our problems are 10 times greater than we find in North America and we still have to get 18 times. And if we don't do it right, this is what's going to happen to our crop. And countries have fallen because of this disease. It's called Phytophthora infestans or late blight. And the late blight of potatoes moved a lot of people from Ireland to this country. Troubles in Poland, on and on and on with the potato. The same disease that hits tomatoes is also on potatoes. We can't have this under our conditions. And then when we see an insect, you know the typical thing in America, if you see an insect, just grab a spray can and kill it. You know, I call it squirt and look. And you know, and we're trying to be real scientific today to protect all the people that spraying the insect, but what about all of us having to breathe it? Now I don't mean to be Rachel Carson's coming in here and, and setting up a big scare campaign. But I will say this to you, that we've had more people dying of cancer in the small communities of Minnesota and Wisconsin, Dakotas and so forth. They said, you know, we never had this kind of thing before. And the last thing the farmers want to do is scream chemicals because that's their livelihood. But we do have a lot of problems. We know that over 55, 60 percent of many of our wells in rural America are contaminated with chemicals. If it doesn't look like a soybean, you spray it with a herbicide. So this is the problem that we have to solve. You know, you know, I don't know if you know it or not, but last year in China they had 10,000 deaths due to pesticide usage. And that's a small percentage of what we dump from our heavy chemical industry. And we don't learn. 1951, they had a heavy fog in London and 3,000 people died. So I don't know what it takes. I call it crisis management, but that's, I'm hoping to say that we don't have to get to a crisis, that through Biosphere 2 we can better understand these systems and together work it out. Okay, so if we can't spray, what do we do? Well, we're going to have to learn about insects. We're going to have to learn about which are the good guys and the bad guys. Now, I had to find out, because I had 35,000 people coming through a show and they smelled the chemical. You know, everyone wants to sue today. And if you could sue Mickey Mouse, boy, they'll try it. Because that Disney organization's got a lot of money. So what we had to do is that we had to go in there and grow crops without any pesticides whatsoever. 
So we started looking for insects, and we started teaching our people which were the good guys. And one of the techniques, say, I found some eggs, he, she says. I found, what do we do with that? Do I squash them? Do I keep them? And so we brought an entomologist that had been to school for a number of years. He said, my gosh, he said, that belongs to the, that belongs to the lace wing. And that lace wing, when he's really hungry as a larva, can eat about 20 of those aphids in a day. So this is what a lace wing looks like. So those eggs hatch into this guy, and he eats the aphids. He eats the bad guy, you see? So we've got to know which to squish and which to keep. And then we have a little wasp that's almost microscopic. It flies along, and it lays eggs into the aphid, and it does a good job for us. But the trouble is, in today, in American agriculture, we're spraying everything. We're killing everything. And you were told this winter that the prices of lettuce were very high because of a cold winter in Yuma. It was not that. It was caused by a virus that was carried by a white fly. We didn't tell anyone about it because we were afraid that the press would say that we, well, how much chemical are you spraying? Anyway, we were doing it safely, I can say that. You weren't eating any pesticides because we have very strict laws in this country. But it can't go on because it's very costly to everyone. Okay, this is what happens to a cucumber crop in a matter of, a matter of hour. We have a spider that goes on there and just sucks all the juices out of the leaves and it turns yellow. Well, we have a spider that eats a spider, you see. And we call this uh, uh, Phytocelius persimus is the genus and species name of the predator. So we have predators and parasites. Whoops, next, next go around. We don't have that many more slides. Then you can take a stretch here a minute and I'll take a drink of water. Okay, well we have some other insects too that not only eat other insects, but insects that are very beneficial just on the transfer of pollen. You know, we have flowers that have male flowers and female flowers. If you ever grow in squash plants and, and, you, and you say, I just can't get any zucchini squash in my plant. Well, you probably don't have any bees because you got, you got a flower that opens up but it has no little squash underneath. And that's the male flower, you see. So I'm gonna give you a little lesson here about sexual expression in flowers. I know that's what you came for tonight. But anyway, you got the male flower there and no little ovary underneath, but you gotta get that pollen from that male flower over to the female. And the bees do the job for us. If you don't have any bees, you're gonna to have to do it with a little paintbrush. Or you're gonna to have to do it like this. So I picked the male portion here and went over to the female portion. We rub noses, and there we have it. We, we will have this little ovary now grow into a zucchini squash. I always like to talk to old ladies groups and garden clubs about it. They always come awake when I talk about this. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna talk about aquaculture because this is a, a absolutely a fantastic fish, and it's the fish you're going to find in America in the future. It's a fish that came out of Africa, its origin is out of Mozambique, Africa. It's spread throughout the world today. It's the second most consumed fish in the world. You probably know about it. If you've ever been to Israel, they call it St. Peter's fish. If you're a biblical scholar, it's the fish that Christ fed the loaves and fishes. It's called tilapia. I always tell people I know why Christ was able to walk on the Sea of Galilee because he's walking on all these fish. But anyway, you can put up to 100 kilos. Now what's 100 kilos? There's 2.2 pounds in a kilo. So you got 220 pounds in a cubic meter of water. If you know what a cubic meter is, a cubic yard. That's how many fish we can put in that area. We, we, we say that that's just a lot of biomass, you see. Okay, so we're going to do some fish in there. and we, we have a fish here, one of the species that we like to color very much, but it has a very large head, but it's very, also very resistant to disease. But we know, we, we know that we're going to use the heads for fertilizer and there's not much fillet there. But we found another species of tilapia that had a very small head. So we crossed the two together to keep the color but get the small head. So let's go ahead and look. Let's look at that head. And we crossed this one with a small head. Okay, now we've redesigned that sucker, you see? And we got 15% size greater on our fillet. And that's what brings the bucks in the market, is the fillet. We're not big on eating fish heads. You gotta go to China and France for that. Okay. 
Okay, so anyway, we end up with a nice fillet in the package, and this is, I could, we, got, we got industry coming in right now into Arizona, and they're going to be producing between three and four million pounds in another three years with the warm water that we have in the deserts of Arizona. And as I tell people who eat a lot of catfish, look out. This is the fish you don't need, hush puppies and coleslaw. It's a gourmet fish. Okay, I'm just joking. Okay. Here's the fish that we're going to put in the biosphere because it takes a tremendous amount of abuse. It can take seawater, it can take fresh water, it can't take cold water. It's got to have warm water. It can take a lot of nitrogen waste in the water. It can't take ammonia. So we said, okay, if that fish has got a lot of excrement and we have that many fish in the water, what are we going to do with the waste of the fish? So we said, well, grow food with it. Well, we started, and our food didn't look very good. You can see that this lettuce wasn't much thriving. <laughs> and what I was doing is that we had the lettuce growing through the board, and the board was floating on the water, and I can grow great lettuce like that if I have a soluble chemical fertilizer. I grow beautiful lettuce with the board just floating on the water. Then over there, I got the fish. I had to keep the fish separated from the lettuce, you see, because the fish are herbivores and they eat all the roots. They give them a crew cut right down to the nibbins. But you see that gravel in between there. That's very important because that's part of the whole system. In that, that's the home for the bacteria that we call nitrosomonas and nitrobacter. If that fish goes over, if that water goes over just a small one part per million, it's a very small amount of ammonia, the fish are dead. But if I put bacteria in that gravel and I pass that water through there, that bacteria will convert the ammonia to nitrate. And now I can go to 200 parts per million nitrate. But it's another form of nitrogen. So anyway, we did all of that and we were converting everything, but for some reason we just weren't getting the lettuce to grow. So what I did was to plant the lettuce directly into the biofilter. And it worked. What we were doing was getting the solids from the fish and we had to get the roots in direct contact with the solids rather than the solids floating down to the bottom where the roots couldn't get it. So here's where a little green thumb comes in. As I say, some people can play piano, some people can grow plants. But you take a little bit of art and science together and it works. So we're growing lovely plants now where we, we have the normal nutrient solutions with the chemical fertilizer you see on the left hand side we can grow as good a plants with all the waste coming from the fish. And so it's also important what we have in the diet of the fish, but we're able to do that. And the most interesting thing to the China, in China that I went there was for them to see that. They do this for thousands of years in China. We do, we're able to do it with this system with 14 kilos per cubic meter. China does it with one. They were so excited to see this. They said, we could feed another billion people. No, they didn't say that. But anyway, it will make a difference. That's probably why they lost their population control. But anyway, so here we are. We can have fish growing like you see in the water. And we can take that water directly out of that tank. And we can flow it through tubes where the solids are going down past the roots. And you can see the roots are very dark with excrement from the fish. This is organic gardening all the way. And you can see the beautiful plants we can grow. But this is today what we're doing in science, what we're doing in agriculture, to recycle and regenerate the waste that we are polluting spaceship, our spaceship or biosphere one. We will look on ways that maybe we can grow melons over warm water that will be used as storage tanks. But while that water is there, we can plant lettuce through that. And under the lettuce, we can have nets. And this is the lettuce that we will grow. But down below, we will have nets that we will keep the fish below. And somehow, we got, we're having some problem with the nitrogen thing here. But we think we can work it out, maybe, where we have the fish again, lettuce and melons growing overhead. And the thing is that when the lettuce is out, the melons are ready to harvest. And they simply fall into the water. The water is a cushion, so the melons won't crack. Anyway, it all works. It's just not economical, but it all does work. The only place it works real well is down at Disney World, and uh, people love to see it. But these are all systems that are on the, on the shelf that are alternatives and opportunities that are ahead of us that all work very well, producing a lot per cubic volume of area. Food processing, these are all the things. I don't know if you, you go down to Safeway or to your store and you see all these things on the shelf, and then you have to grow these things and be responsible to process it and, and store it. 
and you remember many times in your families where you grew up you used to can things and, and maybe dried some things but when you start getting into soybeans and you got anti-nutritional compounds you got to get rid of these are all the different processes we have to go through in order to have a diet for eight people and a biosphere for two years so there's a lot of things that we have to do and a lot that we're learning well the first test modules are on the construction we're working with Pierce uh, construction uh, Peter Pierce is a is, is space frame structures this is what it will look like this is not the actual thing this is a model that has been built it will look like that we see other spin-offs well I guess I don't have that in here well the, the spin-offs really from all of this will be we will learn maybe to clean our air we will learn many many things from biosphere 2 for biosphere 1 in the NASA programs today they say that we have had 30,000 different spin-offs whether it's a computer chip whether it's that tang orange drink or whether it's the tennis shoes the soles of your tennis shoes that were designed to walk on the surface of the moon there's going to be a lot of spin-offs and one of the spin-offs we see from the NASA programs is that we can have satellites that go around the earth and they can photograph the crops and tell us the, the condition of those crops we can tell whether we have a nutrient deficiency we can tell whether we have a fertilizer or insect outbreak or whatever and we can control that from a panel this is what we'll be doing in the future but we'll have similar things that will spin off from biosphere too but this is where we can photograph the cotton fields of Arizona and the dark red that you see is nice green crops the yellow is where our diseases come in what we call Texas root rot and we can go right to the area and find it and we diagnose this right from the air so these are the fantastic things that will come into play to feed everyone but a lot of the research and a lot of the understanding of this planet that we live on the ecological systems the biology the life sciences for which all of you will design your your future is going to come out of biosphere too so we feel very strong about that we think it will have a great importance and maybe after it's all done maybe we'll just go to Mars well I've enjoyed being with you tonight and I pictured I, I gave you a, a, a one-sided story a very nice picture of it but it is very technical we have a lot of good hope for it we are talking to the cosmonauts in the Soviet Union we believe that in the future the America the Soviets have the rocketry to go to Mars we think the Americans will have the biology we think we both have something to bring to the party and together we will go to Mars I'd rather go together work together than the course that we have been on and hopefully through some of the initiatives that have been put forth on nuclear disarmament that those monies can be put together towards science in saving this planet that we live on and just remember one thing is nothing really impossible our only limitation is in how we think thank you okay you have any questions okay I will try to repeat the question yes okay okay how, how, how do we start the whole thing off okay since biosphere is closed and we have to recycle everything how do we get the whole thing started well what we'll do is that we'll start bringing crops in and we'll start in an open environment and then we'll go on their short-term closure in other words we'll go in closure for maybe two hours and then we'll stretch it to four hours and we'll prolong the period of time to when we end up to to two uh, to uh, two years so we'll start under open conditions in the beginning and then gradually work towards closure and then start monitoring the, the, the oxygen CO2 balance, That's, which is one of the real critical things. Yeah, another question, yes. Okay, the, the hydroponic tanks uh, in one of the slides weren't really working well. Well, that was one where the fish where the fish waste was coming well actually the fish waste was actually being lodged into the into the biofilter and it wasn't getting over to where the plant was it was the solid waste oh 
Oh, with the mist, with the lettuce? Yes. Oh, oh, I know what you're talking about. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's not working well economically. Economically. It works fantastic to grow lettuce. You know, I think, I think what's going to happen next, uh, yeah, it doesn't work economically, but I think you're going to find this in restaurants and supermarkets next. The Japanese have copied this and are already putting it in the supermarkets to kind of show people how food is really growing. People want to know how their food is growing and relate to that. And again, it's back, bringing the country back to the city kind of approach. And well, I think for that kind of setting, to create an atmosphere of, of, of a farm environment, we'll see it used for that. Now, I see one day that I'm working with a group of Canadians now where we have plastic, where the plastic comes off a roll and it goes over another roller and then we have robotics that are punching the little lettuce plants into this plastic, right? And the whole sheet comes off. Oh, oh with, the mist, with the lettuce? Yes. Oh, oh, I know what you're talking about, yes. Yeah, yeah, it's not working well economically. Economically, it works fantastic to grow lettuce. You know, I think, I think what's going to happen next, uh, yeah, it doesn't work economically, but I think you're going to find this in restaurants and supermarkets next. The Japanese have copied this and are already putting it in the supermarkets to kind of show people how food is really growing. People want to know how their food is growing and relate to that. And again, it's back, bringing the country back to the city kind of approach. And well, I think for that kind of setting, to create an atmosphere of, of, of a farm environment, we'll see it used for that. Now, I see one day that I'm working with a group of Canadians now where we have plastic, where the plastic comes off a roll and it goes over another roller, and then we have robotics that are punching the little lettuce plants into this plastic, right? And the whole sheet comes on, eight foot wide, it keeps coming on, goes 100 feet on clothesline wires, and then that whole system folds down. You follow me? And now we grow the lettuce there, and then when we're ready to harvest it, it comes back up, and now we pull the belt the other way, and we harvest. It all works. Not quite economical. We're close. That we're having some development now in Newfoundland right now on, the, on this very thing. And we might just sell it to the Soviet Union. Okay, thank you. Oh, yeah, I think so. We, we can do a lot of this now, and I think it's a decision that we as Americans have to make. You have to decide whether we're going to work a little bit in the garden every night to take care of things, or, you know, watch all in the family or something, you know. No, it's not on anymore, but, you know, I think America has not yet, I think we see more and more Americans becoming dedicated to growing their own food, and I think that when we realize that it's also good psychotherapy to grow food and have plants around and work with plants. I think, you know, in England they do it a lot. A lot of gardening in England. And I always look at England and say 10 years will be similar. So I think, yes, no, we can grow a lot of our vegetables at home. We can grow them right in the house. But you've got to have light coming in. You've got to have it on the south side. And uh, we've got to have some shops around where you can go down and get the ladybird beetles and the lace wings and those things easily. Right now it's pretty costly to do that. But I, th I see it becoming more commonplace, but I th think also not only having fresh food, I think it's going to be good for the old head. Yes, Glenn. This is loaded, but uh, the dinner you mentioned the, the element that actually would be the impetus to uh, radically I think the only way that we're radically going to change anything that will be global in nature is we will have a lar large Chernobyl. Uh, it's just unfortunate that, that we operate, especially in America, and it's one of our great disadvantages under our system is that we operate on, under what I call crisis management. Not, we don't seem to change things until there's a crisis, until we are affected ourselves, either from a monetary standpoint or members of our family are taken away. And I think there's one other possible avenue that we might be able to have some influence on the people as a whole on Spaceship Earth. And I think, and you know, I hate to say it, and some of you probably will disagree, but I think Walt Disney can do a lot. Um, 
and Walt Disney is concerned about that. They're going to be building the third, the fourth Disney operation in, outside of Paris, France. And they've been hung up now for about three years trying to decide exactly how they're going to build that because they want people this time to walk away with a message. But they also want people to come there knowing that we're not, we're not going to have people coming in there and say, no, you just sit down right here, we're going to educate you. Because right away we just blank right out. As soon as someone, you know, we've pictured that first grade teacher and you said, oh, I don't want to have anything to do with it. So once you start telling, ed you're going to educate someone, they don't want anything to do with it. But they're going to come there to get entertained, but they're going to walk away with a message. And hopefully, with the millions that can come through that kind of facility, gradually, if you get enough people, you can get that message across and it will be kind of normal thinking. But otherwise, it's going to be I think a, a major catastrophe that will bring it about. And we have to remember that we have five billion of those people out there in the year 2000 that just worry that day how they're going to feed themselves. And it's, that's a critical thing, how we can reach those people also to be participants and better managers. Right now they can't afford even to be a manager. They manage just barely to get enough food. Yeah. Well, um, one of the things, I, I guess the biggest, the, the, the driving force in my own life is when people tell me something that can't be done. So uh, most of the problems any, in any country that I've worked on have been political problems. It's because Mordida or Bakshis, they say in Arabic, you got to pay someone off. And so I, um, I was very interested in this fish, and I remember when, when, the, when the recording was made, We Are the World, and I went all over the world and I would hear that. It was just absolutely moving. And I came back home and I met with Ken Cragen and uh, Marty Rogel, who was manager of Harry Belafonte, and I met with those people and I said, you know, we really have some good ideas, I think, at the University of Arizona in our deserts that I think we can transport over to some of these other countries that would make a difference. Because I don't believe putting food on docks and piers is a solution. Because what you're doing in that, in that case here, it's a very short solution, but what you're doing is, is, is hurting the economy of those farmers who are growing food and selling food. So I believe in the concept of uh, teaching them how to fish. But anyway, I decided that, that because I, it never worked out that I would go to Ethiopia and those countries, so I said, well, I, just, I got one of the greatest countries for practice right next door, it's Mexico. So we chose one of the poorest areas, uh, it, was a, uh, it was a ajito, they call it. It's, a, it's an area set up by the government where they have the people living on it called the Campesino. And I went there to build a fish pond. And we built a fish pond very cheaply. We built it with plastic and we, we put some concrete and sand and tubes and soaked it with water and they hardened up and we had a nice fish pond that would be there forever. But I had one problem, I couldn't get the fish across the border. And I started uh, on permits in Mexico City t two months prior, everything legal. So I finally gave up and I hired a two-engine two -engine airplane and flew them over and dropped them in. But anyway, the, the fish are growing very well, I can report to you. And uh, they are now all over Alamos area. If you've ever been to Alamos, it, all the little mining tailing ponds, it's warm water and they're full of tilapia and doing very well. So it was worth it, the thousand dollars on the twin-engine airplane. And we had a whole group of people went down and the, it was, I think, the highlight of their life. That went down on this experiment. We did, we slept on school floors and planted uh, salt bushes and so forth for cattle. But it, it was, a, it was a, a small thing that made a difference for our community. And I think we have to look for those kinds of things in every day of our life, whether it's here in Los Angeles. Yes. Yes, we, we have worked with. Uh, a lot of those, but the driving force of nitrogen is incredible. You know, to keep the to keep the bloom going without it dying off and, and killing the whole thing. And so we worked with a lot of the different algae that you know you could they, they sell them in health food stores and some of those. But uh, they will be a factor. But basically, feeding the fish right now. But we know also the. The man needs a lot of roughage. We need a lot of roughage in our in our diet, but algae could be a part of it. But 
The Biospherans haven't been very, very, very good candidates for eating algae. They don't like it very much. <laughs> and they're paying the research bill. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, they're, they're, they're doing that now, uh, not in the biosphere itself. We have the prototypes built, and they're to get practice. Uh, I, I think, unfortunately, they're not getting the practice in a quick enough way. I, I think it's one of the things that, that they're going to face down the way that they're going to have to have a Manhattan project to get up to speed on growing food. And I'm hoping that they don't call on me to go in there with them. You know, I, I've had this happen a number of places. I've been shipped over with the ruler of Abu Dhabi to grow, end up growing over there. But no, I don't plan to go in there for two years. But the thing is that uh, we're training them now. Yes. Right. Yes, it is. That's it. Well, the difference they're doing now and the difference they would have in actual use is that we would have a lot of gamma radiation problems. We would have to have uh, uh, fabrics or skins that would keep a lot of that out if possible. We would have to work on their artificial lighting because there's not the near enough, there's not the light that we have on, 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 a, on a lunar base or planet Mars. Uh, there's quite a lot of things different. And I think, originally, their, their, their intent was, yes, we'll go to Mars, but I think they've backed off on that now and know that that would be a long way off, possibly. And they're basically working with Biosphere 2 now to, to better understand Biosphere 1. But there's some dr other drastic changes there that have to be done if we're going to take it on. The experiments you mentioned the University of Arizona referring to them as not economical yet. Uh, do you foresee when uh, the larger scale or something they do become economical? Or? Yes, <clears throat> I think so. I think as we get into and again, I talk in a developed world situation. I think if we get into computer imaging, robotics, uh, some of these artificial intelligence systems that we can set up systems that will be mostly automated. But uh, again, that is a system that might work here, but in a, in, a, in, a, in a culture where they need to employ people, that probably wouldn't work, you see. I'm not sure whether that, on the ozone situation, I, I just don't see how we could relate to that at the moment. I think on acid rain, I think on CO2, yes, we can probably get some answers with that. And also on, uh, on the degradation of chemicals in soils. I'm, not, I, I'm very sure that in the future where we have hydrocarbons polluting our water aquifer, that we will have bugs that we will be able to put in there that would chew that up and, and break that down. I'm quite sure that's going to happen. And I think a lot of that testing can be done right under the biosphere, under closure, very controlled conditions. Yes? Uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, in a home, you use air pumps, so you use PPG, right, right. Uh, that you can uh, utilize the uh, effective uh, plastic. Well, yes, you, you, you have a lot of volatile organic materials that come off of plastics and so forth that we find in on their home settings and they say that with the certain plant species um, in fact this is the article here that I took out of the magazine it's called high-tech house plants and there was here he said that if you had uh, he estimates that 15 to 20 golden golden pothos and spider plants can clean and refresh the air in the average 18 square foot home, 18, 1800 square foot home. He also thinks there already are enough existing plants in place to purify the air in most shopping malls. You see? Anyway, uh, so go home and buy some plants, or maybe you have plants. Yeah, it's a spider plant. They're very easy to grow. 
Yeah, it's a spider plant. It's, it, it, they call it airplane plant too. It's the same name. And it's the one, it has very bulbous roots. If you ever took the spider plant and looked at the roots, they're very bulbous and tissue and um, able to take in a lot of these gases and ever, evidently break them down. One in the back there. No, we don't have that. That has not been brought in at the moment, but that will be. There will be people called in for that, and they are under their own training at the moment with psychologists. One of the problems is if you're locked up with eight people for two years, they get pretty crotchety at times. You can imagine. So they're adopting some of the principles that have been developed by NASA, where you express frustration through theatrics. So they will have plays every one month or so. That they, and then they just vent their frustration through the character that they're playing. I mean, they don't have anywhere where they shoot someone, but you know, they, just, they, they, they go through some pretty violent uh, sets at times. Oh, I absolutely, I, well, let me just, sum that up what you're saying. We know from studies done in hospitals that the person in a bed can look out a window and see a plant that the, re that the occupancy rate of that room is cut in half. That's been some pretty good studies come out of studies now that are coming out of hospitals. And so that's why they're trying to have more and more plants and windows you can look out of. Yes, plants are extremely important to the mental health of people. And they must be included in any architecture because if it's going to be plastic and cement, forget it. Well, I, I don't know why I'm saying it. I'm talking like a horticulturist, but I agree with you 100%. I, I really believe in it. Yes. I don't know. I have no idea. Well, I, I, I don't know if, you know if they have done any, been able to do enough psychoanalysis on this kind of thing to say this is the reason other than just some peace of mind or something that's, I, I don't have the, I, I don't know. I haven't really gone into it. Pardon? I, could, I don't know what it is. I have no idea whatsoever. But there's something that uh, is one of, uh, it's something that I have wanted to really study more of and I just haven't had a chance to do it. But I was told this by a hospital administrator about three months ago and I haven't had a chance to look at it. But I don't know what it is. All I know is that in a lot of countries where they're dark and crowded, you go to Holland, in, in England, in Denmark, in some of those communities, even in China, they have a lot of plants in the house. And you know it in Holland because they keep the blinds open all the time. Exactly. No, they will be extremely busy, and that's been, we've been doing a lot of, there's been a lot of time and motion studies done, even preparing the food. And so, no, they're going, to, we're trying to get that cut down as much as possible. I, I don't, frankly, I just sometimes don't know if they're going to make it. Uh, if, I know you're all thinking about how many males and how many females are going in there. I don't know that either. <laughs> and I don't think they've decided yet, but... Uh, they were going to have that in there, but, but it takes too much uh, plant protein away from, from, from direct use by humans. And we just don't have the area to grow that uh, luxurious way of uh, providing protein. So we're going to get all the animals out except for, for the fish. Yeah, I'll take one more. The ocean is still going to be there. And that is under the leadership of Dr. Walter Aidy of the Smithsonian. And uh, I haven't followed that recently. I don't know how that's coming along. The fish, 
will be growing in the in the in the in the agricultural area, and uh, we'll, we think we'll have some fish from the ocean as well, but we're not counting on it at the moment. Okay, I'll quit. Thanks. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, next week is the final lecture of the Intersection series and it will feature Robert Winter, a musicologist. So please come back next week. Thank you.